everyone welcome to hello everyone welcome to week 10 of the open ols uh, uh, program and uh, this call is being recorded and transcribed if you do not want to show your face uh, it now it's time to switch off the camera and uh, uh, please fill yourself uh, uh, in the roll call by introducing yourself and also it would be nice to hear your response to the icebreaker question and also uh, I, I remind you for the code of conduct of the OLS and we are we will be respectable uh, 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 we sh should show respectable behavior for everyone who is joining the call and or otherwise in the slack if you face uh, any unacceptable behavior please contact organizers and uh, you at the email team at openlifescience.org and if uh, if it is involving one of the organizers you could individually reach out to the other organizers and uh, uh, the other thing i would uh, request you to change your name by including whether you prefer written uh, room or spoken discussion. If you are both, uh, please also include that here so that it will be helpful for the breakout session. And with that, I would hand over to Tas. Um, yes, thank you, Pradeep. So I will start the call by sharing my screen to see where we are in the um, cohort call and then hand that over to the first speaker. So we are in week 10, sorry about my numerous tabs open. We're in week 10 and this is open garden two. We had open garden one, I think um three weeks ago in week um six, yes. And today we are in week 10. What we have, yeah, thank you. This slide helps a lot. So we had open science garden week one and then today we are open, having open science garden week two. Generally, for the open science, we are going to have three sessions. And for each call, we are going to talk about one of the um, elements of open science. In the first, in, in today's session, we are going to talk about open educational resources, open access publication, open engagement of social actors. Previously, we had um, open data, openness to diversity of knowledge, and open evaluation. And that means in the last um, session for open science guidance, we are going to have open science infrastructure, open source software, and open hardware. With that, I will stop um, sharing my screen and hand over to the first person presenting, uh, which is Toby. Uh, Toby, please, um, you may share your screen and do your presentation. Thank you. Thanks, Taj. Um, is it possible for somebody else to present first? I am still having all kinds of technical difficulties over here. If anyone else would be willing to jump in, that would give me the few minutes, few extra minutes I need to get things sorted out. Sure. Um, Angela, you would, would you want to go first? Thank you. Yeah, sure. I can do that. Um, uh, I was trying to save the presentation so that I could share it, um, but I'll, yeah, I'll, I'll place in the link um, shortly. <clears throat> um, just give me one second. I'm quite excited. Is it okay if I share my screen? Um, yes, please. Okay, fantastic. Hopefully you can see it. Uh, yes. All right. Um, so um, thank you for the kind invitation to join your cohort call um, today. I think it's, um, you know, an honor to be invited to speak. I'll start off with a very brief introduction to myself. My name is Angela Odolungati. I'm based out of Nairobi, Kenya. I like to describe myself as a technologist, a community builder, and an open source software advocate who's um, passionate about building and using appropriate tools to impact the lives of disenfranchised communities. And I've been doing this kind of work for just over a decade. Um, I'm the executive director at Ushahidi, um, which I'll talk about in more detail, but it's a global nonprofit um, that empowers people through citizen-generated data to develop solutions uh, for good. <clears throat> I also sit on the board of Creative Commons and the Humanitarian Open Street Map team, um, and also sit on the World Economic Forum's Global Future Council on Data Equity. 
So to begin, I think I'll start with a quick historic background into the company. Um, Ushahid is a Swahili word that means testimony. Um, and it's an organization that was founded um, in 2008 following the post-election violence that broke out after the 2007 general elections. Um, a lot of what was happening on the ground then was largely underreported or not reported at all. So <clears throat> a group of um, five Kenyan bloggers basically came together to help uh, ordinary Kenyans shed light on what was happening around end to them. And so they built this platform, what you're seeing on the screen right now, it's actually a snapshot of the very first instance. Um, and people could text in or fill out a web form and have that information quickly aggregated and visualized on a map. Um, and this essentially gave Kenyans a voice when no one else could or would because um, a lot of what was documented, um, I mean, really empowered people to become witnesses um, and you know be able to share their experiences on a global stage and where possible even feed that data to um, domestic, and, uh, domestic and international investigators working towards accountability for crimes. Mm -hmm. Now, over the last 16 years, we've grown into an organization that um, develops integrated tools and services to enable people to generate solutions um, and mobilize their communities for good. And so the tools we build empower people to, um, you know, rapidly and purposefully gather, analyze, respond, and act on data and information from the ground. And so we have this flagship platform that is named after the organization called the Ushahidi platform, which is an open source crowdsourcing tool that makes it very easy to collect data via different streams. We have SMS, email, Twitter, web platform, native applications on Android and on iOS, um, and most recently have also put in USSD um, and WhatsApp. Um, <clears throat> the platform also makes it easy or you know, is, is meant to support um, data management. So figuring out how information is flowing within so that you have um, you know, you can understand what's happening and unfolding with a near real-time feed and you can visualize them as they're unfolding, um, but also to really drive you towards um, a response based on what it is that you're seeing. So overall, I think the goal is to empower um, local communities to become active participants in stories being told um, about their location. <clears throat> now, our work is primarily focused on actually four impact areas, um, namely humanitarian and disaster relief. So this idea of connecting people during times of crisis with the support that they need, um, human rights protection, creating awareness around human rights atrocities that might be going on, good governance, um, the idea of supporting democratic societies um, and holding um, duty bearers to account, and most recently climate change, finding ways of centering the citizen voice at the heart of the conversation, not just focusing on other traditional data sets. <clears throat> And the ultimate goal that we are looking for is long-term systemic change um, in this quest for social justice. We want citizens to feel, or rather disenfranchised communities to feel more included. We want organizations to be more effective um, in whatever actions they take. Um, we'd like for policies and decisions being made, be it at a local, regional, national, international level to be more inclusive and representative of the needs of all people. Um, and we also want to support building an ecosystem that thrives on open innovation and collaboration. So this idea of strengthening the open source bit of it. <clears throat> However, we recognize that our strength as an organization lies in providing the tech and expertise to organizations um, that will use the platform to raise the voices of these um, underrepresented groups and then use that data to create the impact they want to see in the world. I think the way one of the founders said it is, if there's anybody here who watches James Bond, uh, who's watched the movies, we are Q, we are not 007. We will give you the tools that you need to go save the world, but ultimately, um, we support building organizations or groups of people who can become 007s in their own uh, way. <clears throat> now, I typically tend to use this slide at the end of my presentation, but I'm going to use it at the start to drive my point home a little earlier, especially within the context of this idea of engaging social actors um, in different conversations. Um, I look at um, platforms like Ushahidi and many others, um, like Fat Thailand, because they represent um, the potential for greater participation, improved decision making, being able to build trust, creativity, and also building some level of contextualization. 
And then I think about the data and information that we gather via these platforms, like having really good seeds, seeds that hold promise to flourish and yield good produce if they are appropriately handled. But without farmers to till your land, <laughs> Your fertile land and good seeds are useless. Um, you know, that farm will not flourish without people putting in hard work into getting that produce from that land um, or people who will, you know, buy the produce. So in, in the context of the world that we live in, I think people tend to look at ordinary um, citizens or local communities as, um, <clears throat> you know, people that would be you know, fairly simple or not educated in, in the sense, um, while ignoring the fact that these people better understand um, the issues that they are facing. And so overall, I think that what we've been trying to push over the last 16 years is an understanding that we can no longer look at local communities as passive recipients of information, <clears throat> but active participants instead. I think this also became very clear for us during the COVID-19 crisis, that it took collective responsibility and collective intelligence to come out of um, that uh, crisis. And with that understanding in mind, we've been very intentional about fostering inclusiveness in how we build and design our tools because we recognize the importance of meeting people where they are. Right? If the goal is to empower communities to thrive as a result of access to data and technology, then that data and technology needs to make sense to them and they need to be able to interact with it in ways that allows them to considering all the factors um, in, in which they exist. And so how we've gone about achieving this goal is by first and foremost, we've made the platform open source. So that reduces the burden of cost um, and it makes the platform accessible regardless of the um, financial ability. And it also allows them um, or allows anybody who's using the platform as with other open source tools to be creative and not having to build something from scratch. Second thing that we've tried to do is, you know, we've innovated around the tools that people already have access to. The mobile phone, it's the most ubiquitous tool. When a crisis hits, the first thing you'll do is you'll pick up your phone and try and call somebody or send a text message. So it made sense that we would also try and innovate um, around that. That we've also tried to make the platform available in multiple languages so that people are able to interact with the data in languages that they are familiar with, recognizing that I think it, I need to correct my stats around this, but I think less than a quarter of the world speaks English fluently, right? And so it's very important to make sure that we are capturing and allowing them to be able to engage in that way. I think the beautiful thing about open systems and open source software is that they're very generative in nature. You know, They provide a framework or a skeleton upon which you can build on top of and adapt to your own local context. So you know, it really does allow you to take this to make it your own and then use it in ways that you, you know, that we could never imagine. So it's not about picking a tool or picking a solution or um, you know, anything from somewhere else and then copying and pasting it. It also allows you to be very intentional about trying to understand the situation um, and the appropriateness of being able to use something and then um, adapting it. <clears throat> and I think looking back at all of these decisions that were made from the very beginning, I think this has led to wide scale use of our platform. Now, this is a tool that you always tend to associate with Africa, low bandwidth, bad governance, um, that has ended up being used in more than 116 countries, uh, 160 countries in the last 16 years, more than 200,000 times. You'll always imagine Africa as a place that receives technology and innovation, yet here we are kind of um, exporting it. Um, since inception in 2008, the platform has been used to advance democracy, report incidences, mobilize crisis response, um, influence change, and encourage activism. And I want to briefly take you through a couple of examples based on um, the areas of social impact that I mentioned before. One of the, the, the major ones, whenever anybody talks about Ushahidi, they think about is humanitarian and disaster relief. I think this stems from the work that we did in 2010 during the Haiti earthquake. It was probably the very first time that a technology tool was being used actively in the moment in a near real-time fashion to engage with, you know, connect humanitarian responders with people who are affected by crisis um, and really just help to improve the efficiency of data management and collection and the response ultimately. Um, one of my favorite examples around this is actually from the COVID-19 um, <clears throat> crisis. Um, it's called Frenala Curva. Um, and 
there was a group of, I think it was um, at the technology community, but a few, you know, technology hubs as well. This was at the height of the lockdowns in Spain, who came together to try and figure out how to provide resources to people who um, were unable to get access to them during the lockdown. So they developed this mutual aid platform where people could indicate I, you know, who has needs, who has the capacity to meet those needs, volunteers, um, and were, were able to connect um, people who are in high risk situations with essential, with access to essential um, items. I believe they managed to <clears throat> uh, distribute more than 28,000 masks in that time. Um, but that's not even the reason why it's my favorite. It's the fact that they took this tool without our intervention. They translated the resources into Spanish and then created a template around this is how you deploy the software. This is, these are some of the partnerships that you need to set in place. Um, and these are some of the other factors to consider or people that you need to talk to if you need funding. And we ended up seeing more than 22 Frana La Curva maps in Spanish speaking countries around the world during that time. So it not only speaks to supporting during a time of crisis, but the power of open source um, as well. Um, I'll try and go quickly just because I recognize that our time is not, um, well, time, time is of the essence. Um, I think the, the second area that people tend to think about with Shahidi as well is elections, good governance, given that we were born out of an electoral crisis. Um, so we've you know, developed a toolkit that many people have been able to take and replicate so that they're able to use a platform to engage with um, citizens and voters and disenfranchised communities around the electoral process, um, really focusing on it being more of a um, proactive measure towards protecting votes um, and ensuring a free, fair, and peaceful outcome. Um, and so we've done this in Kenya since 2007. Um, we did it in 2010 during our constitutional referendum, 2013, 2017, and even most recently in 2023. And I believe it's also been used for the recently concluded Nigerian elections in 20, in February um, of this year. And then, as I mentioned as well, on the human rights protection side, just really as a means of being able to create awareness about certain things that are going on. So that we're taking the conversation away from, is it going on into, okay, what do we need to do uh, differently? Examples include um, HarassMap that's been documenting cases of sexual harassment against women since 2010. Um, you know, I think during the Arab Spring, um, during the yeah, the 2010s, 2011s as well, just being able to document what was going on there um, during the Black Lives Matter protests and NSAS protests um, in <clears throat> Nigeria as well. And this is one from Iran um, that's been documenting what's been happening with the protests since 2018, including um, the aftermath of the death of Masa uh, Amini. And I believe there's also one that's tracking what's going on in Gaza um, as well. And then when we look at climate change, I think it's been very clear that the conversation is really centered around like, okay, what are the trends that we're seeing in weather patterns? Um, what are we getting in terms of, you know, sensor data, but nobody is really trying to tap into local intelligence because the farmers probably know a little bit better around what the shift has been and what impact that has had on their produce. And that's just one, you know, one example. And so for us, we've been trying to very proactively find ways of centering that citizen voice um, at the heart of it. And the example that I have currently is a, a small scale project in Tana River County, which is 10, a, a county on the southern parts, uh, the southeastern parts of, of Kenya towards the coast that tends to get <laughs> ravaged by drought, um, um, which is obviously a consequence of, of climate change. And so we sought to try and understand, um, one, the perceptions of citizens around what what interventions should be taken, but then also a little bit around their energy consumption and some of their economic activities to maybe detect if there are any drivers of the crisis in the region. And one interesting finding from this was, and this wasn't anything that ever popped up until we started asking these questions. Nursery tree farmers were getting taxed more than people who were cutting down trees to sell charcoal. And so that just inadvertently signals, okay, I need to cut down trees to make money. Cutting down trees, is, there's such a huge and direct correlation um, with climate change. And so who knows what else we might be able to discover, especially when we pair up both the citizen voice and other official data sets, would we be able to get a holistic picture around what's, uh, what's going on? So these are just a couple of examples. I can share links afterwards to other case studies. Um, 
Now, what do I think um, has catalyzed such exponential growth in our platform and platforms like these ones over the years? I think this is best explained with the pothole theory that it takes an action that directly affects you to go over and beyond to act. Um, I think it's clear that the information landscape has changed. Or maybe let me use an example to bring that home. <laughs> um, let's see. News about taxes getting hiked here in Kenya will make my blood boil because that directly affects me. <laughs> Um, I mean, I'll hear about taxes being increased somewhere else, and I will empathize, but not at the same level, because something that has a direct impact on my ability to, you know, keep the lights on, whether in my organization or, um, or, or even in my home. And so it just, it, it's the same, it, it's the same concept that it really does take something that directly affects you to go over and beyond uh, to act. And over the years, we've noticed that the information landscape has also changed. You know, it's no longer about a one-way conversation. Um, citizens who are pa once passive recipients of information are now becoming more active, sharing their opinions and looking for ways for their voices to be heard. I don't know how many of you have been following the drama with OpenAI recently, but that's you know, I mean, that's one classic example, right? There was an assumption that the employees would just be passive around the decision making. And here they are coming together in a collective way, trying to bring out the fact that we are not okay with this and you as the the governing body need to take us seriously. And you can see that as well in other, you know, in other parts um, of the world. In Kenya, we have a phenomenon. When X was called Twitter, people knew about Kenyans on Twitter. Um, in the sense that when something would happen, there would be a huge uproar on social media, and that would act as a way of kind of advocating for change. Recently, the government posted a series of uh, hikes, or rather increases in prices of government services, and people went ballistic, and they came back and adjusted them because of those conversations happening on that social platform. So that just speaks to it. <clears throat> However, I think it's important to note that technology in itself um, is not enough to generate accountability and meaningful engagement because it's not just about the technology. Yes, the tech forms a crucial element in the grand scheme of everything that we seek, but it won't solve all the problems. Many of the successful projects that we've seen at Ushahidi have been a culmination of extensive partnership building, stakeholder engagement to identify shared goals, responsibility, but also coordinate response. Even in this example where I talked about what was going on on Twitter, if we did not have government representation on those social media channels or people who are taking that platform seriously, it would probably just have ended up being a place where we make noise and then nothing happens, right? <clears throat> and it brings me to this point around how we can use technology effectively um, so that we can you know, trigger responses from duty, bear uh, duty bearers, but also use that as a means of building uh, trust. Right, A big part of building trust um, and seeing behavioral change lies in those feedback loops. The first time you post something online and somebody responds, you could be like, okay, this is a, this is a good channel to, to speak up on. Um, and I'll encourage other people to do the same thing because you see something changing. And we've seen the same thing as well, even with Ush the, the Ushahidi platform, right? That you, when you set expectations that you meet those and do that continuously, it will encourage people to keep engaging. If it's a case of you just collect data for the sake of collecting it and you put it somewhere, then you know the, there's there's really no point. So um, yeah, I think more effort needs to go into building trust offline um, beyond just using um, some of these technology tools. And so while it's clear that technology will not bring social change, I think it's what I've been able to demonstrate is that it's a powerful enabler. I think that it can serve as the giant's shoulders that we can all stand on in the quest for social justice. It does provide a really good stepping stone for being able to build on top of that, be it at the civil society level, um, NGOs, um, or even at government levels. So, yeah. I would like to end there and thank you all so much for your patience and listening to me. Um, yeah, and I look forward to hearing some of your questions. Um, thank you very much, Angela. I think, yes, uh, this deserves a very big round of applause. Thank you very much. I can see everybody appreciating your um, talk. I'm going to look at the other part for questions. Um, let me also open that and see if there are any questions because I have okay. yeah. yeah, let me read that out. Um, so this is from you. I love the growth metaphor. We are oilers, although 
to uh, although I think the people are the seed, we water and nurture usually. Uh, mm -hmm. Recently, a couple of Kenyan friends shared their experience of the 2008 electoral violence with me. It was such a life-changing event. I didn't realize that was the root of Oshahid. I uh, can see a question being written. Maybe we can ask those that are in the call if they would like to ask questions for those that have an S to their names. All right. Um, is that Virginia typing the question around the government trying to reach out? Oh, yes. Yeah, sorry. I was <laughs> concentrated <laughs> in writing. <laughs> that's OK. My, my bad. Oh, that's th mm -hmm. thank you, Angela, for this awesome presentation. I mean, what an honor to to see everything you have done um, for such a good cause. I was wondering actually if the government there where you live knows about this, if they have ever tried to contact you and use it for the good, <laughs> like in a higher mm -hmm. level. Mm -hmm. uh, that was the question I was writing. Yeah, so yes, we have had engagements with the government at some level. So well, I'll start with one where we weren't necessarily involved. Um, during the recent elections, we unintendedly discovered that the um the office, I think, well, the office that handles crimes and investigations was actually using an open source version of our platform without like which is exactly what we're looking for anyway. Like they took the platform and set it up for themselves to be able to monitor and you know generally gather information around security incidences. But beyond that, yes, there have been cases where we've worked with um the government um around different issues. So I think one of the major ones that pops up is a project we ran between 2016 and 2018 in conjunction with, um, I think it was a US State Department, it was a program called DREAMS, the DREAMS Innovation Challenge. And the idea was trying to figure out how to reduce HIV prevalence amongst adolescent girls and young women. And so we worked with county health governments, um, as well as other <clears throat> nonprofit um, organizations that were either working to keep girls in school or provide them with access to essential medicine and used our platform as a way of being able to gather feedback directly from these individuals to influence some of the decisions that they were making. Um, I think even in the climate change example, um, we worked well, we were able to channel the feedback from the platform um, around that tax that tax anomaly or that tax ordinance that was a potential driver. And I believe that that's currently being tabled as a conversation. So there are times where we have had direct contact with them. There've been times that they, doubt, you know, they take the software and they make use of it. Um, and there are some cases as well where other NGOs or activists will find ways of partnering with the, you know, working with the government or at least channeling feedback towards them. But overall, I think our focus has generally been mainly elevating and raising the voices of those disenfranchised groups. There have been instances where, uh, instances where that has been, you know, at loggerheads, you know, maybe, maybe more in authoritarian regimes. I recall once when an instance of the platform was set up for elections in Zambia and they tried to take the plat, the platform was nearly taken down. So we've seen both, both ends of the spectrum. Thank you very much for sharing. I mean, I, I understand. And of course, the, da the data you're gathering is so important. That's why I I thought it would be of use. But it's also good that you are staying it outside <laughs> just to be neutral. Thank you very much. Yeah. Thank you so much for the question, Virginia. Um. Thank you, Angela. Let mm -hmm. me check if there are other questions. I don't I, see I any do other one. Question. I do have a question. I'm just curious to ask, how do you keep uh, people engaged with the platform? So I see a lot of platforms out there, but then getting people to really use the platform is another challenge. That's definitely uh, true. Well, first, I think, um, let me start by um, just explaining how exactly we work. I, I don't know how many of you are familiar with WordPress, right? You know, you can either download the software and host on your own servers or make use of our hosted service. So we rarely get involved in like processing or managing data or running different campaigns. Typically it's a 
nonprofit um, or a community organization or an activist or a non, you know, large, small or large NGO that will come in, download or make use <clears throat> of the software. Now, in the early days, I think it was largely a function of the fact that our founders are bloggers. And so they just, they had a very, it was already kind of inbuilt and innate in them to be able to speak about the work in very inspiring ways um, that just helped to get the word out very fast. And then at some point it became the people who are then used in the platform would get to showcase their success. And somebody would say, hey, I want to be able to do the same thing. And this was the genesis of building a community of practice around our work that would allow people to share uh, with each other. It's still largely the same, but then it's also required a lot more proactive effort on our part to do some <clears throat> outward marketing around the existence of the tools, sharing our use cases, being able to show the impact, um, while also working with our community as well to, 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 to surface that. Now, at the level of the people who are running the campaigns, this now goes to the, 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 you know, the bit I said around uh, building trust offline and some of those offline tactics. It takes, depending on the scale of, of, of reach of, of who your audience is, it takes deeply understanding who the audiences are, where they engage. Do they largely engage on social media? Do they, you know, largely engage with print media or, <clears throat> or other means? And then working with local organizations that have trust established um, so that you can keep that engagement um, going and keep people excited about sharing or engaging at that level. But at the higher level as well, it takes designing your campaign in a way that taps into almost like an emotional response of the part, the part of people engaging. What is it that they get out of it? What is the incentive, right? Um, is it that you are tackling an issue that directly affects somebody and they're really passionate about making sure that something is different? And then of course, as well, making sure that you're closing the loop. So if you've come in and you've tapped into my emotional senses of, okay, I need to do something. When I do share information with it, do you do something valuable with it? And so that also requires thinking about who, which partners you have on board um, and how the information flow will lead to those outcomes that the users are expecting. Um, thank you. I was just thinking through uh, a lot of possible use cases in, in Nigeria for, for this. Um, thank you very mm -hmm. much. Thank you. Um, yes, so the, I'm not sure, Toby, can you go now or? Yes, That's yes, I think I can. Yes, I think everything's fine. working. All right, give me a moment to share the right screen and stuff. All right, so. Um, please speak up if you can't see my screen, but uh, usually that part runs smoothly. Um, hi, everybody. So uh, I'm Toby Hodges, pronouns he, him, his. Um, I'm director of curriculum at an organization called the Carpentries, and I'm going to talk today about um, open educational resources, a bit about what they are and why you might want to, why you should um, develop them. Um, and I'll finish up the, originally this title said what, why, and how, and then I realized that in 10 or 15 minutes, that's not enough time to talk about the how. So I'm going to talk about where instead. And, uh, if you're interested in how, then you can ask me afterwards. So the Carpentries, the organization that I work for, um, it's, a uh, community led, um, organization really it is a it's a worldwide community of um, people that are teaching who are teaching um, essential software and data skills um, for open and reproducible research um, we strive to be as inclusive as we can in uh, with that community um, to be open in everything that we do. And I'm going to talk, I guess, in the, for the rest of this about one specific aspect of that, of that openness, but it's not the only, um, the only way in which the Carpentries tries to be open in, in what we do. Um, and we 
value was often referred to as a as a growth mindset we are always learning always looking to gather feedback and um iterate on and improve on the the ways that we're doing things um based on on that feedback that we're receiving and the experience that we're that we're gathering we're probably best known um as an umbrella really for three uh what we what we call lesson programs um those are data carpentry library carpentry and software carpentry um i'm not going to go into the details of the specific differences and similarities between these but suffice to say they target um different but overlapping um audiences i suppose and teach different but overlapping sets of skills to those different audiences um focused on um data organization data handling data analysis in the case of data carpentry library carpentry focuses on sort of um information sciences approaches so um techniques for gathering and storing and searching through um, large amounts of information um, and software carpentry aims to teach good or good enough practices in in software development for for researchers and it's at this point that i really want to mention that um all of the lessons that those um that form those lesson programs that get taught in these workshops for data carpentry library carpentry and software carpentry they're um developed open source i'll talk more about what that means in a moment they're published um under a permissive license um and they're maintained by our community um and those that permissive license and the and the open source aspect um means that that these lessons qualify as um open educational resources which hopefully you'll remember was what i came here to to talk to you about so to take a definition of of open educational resources or oers as they're often um abbreviated to uh i pulled this out from a unesco recommendation on oers that was um it's called it's titled the 2019 unesco recommendation as far as i can tell it was published in 2022 anyway it's relatively recent uh whichever way you look at it um and i think this is a fairly good um definition really the 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 crucial thing being um the these are resources for education in some form that are either released fully into the public domain or copyright is maintained by is, is retained sorry by the people that wrote it but the material is licensed for for reuse adaptation um redistribution and so on by other people um using an open license so to return to the the example of the carpentries um as i mentioned our lessons are, are published um with a permissive open license um the lessons themselves are available as websites on the open internet they're free to access they don't require any kind of um account creation no login or uh, payment or or whatever in order to access and, and use those lessons to read through them and so on um but on the kind of behind the scenes so to speak um the all the files that those lesson websites are built from are hosted um in repositories on github as well as um and so i should say are, are all of the tools and the processes that are used to convert the files in these github repositories into the html pages and so on that you see as a, as a lesson website when you visit the lesson itself um the files in these github repositories then these source files for the lessons those are those are openly licensed we use the creative commons attribution um license version 4.0 for all of the lesson kind of prose content and we use mit license for any example software um that's included in in the lessons because that's appropriate a, a license that's more appropriate for for source code um and the kind of release of these um these lesson repositories via this um permissive open license means that um other people out there can fork that 
um, repository so they can create their own copy of the repository to work with and they can then adapt the content of the lesson and reuse it for their audience um, and for their purposes. Um, and that has a further advantage, uh, which is that you will start to see people who are using and teaching the lesson come back to the source repository for these lessons and um, contribute feedback and report problems that they've encountered with the lesson and so on um, via issues to, to this repository. And they'll also start suggesting changes and improvements, perhaps things to fix those, those problems that they found um, via pull requests. And um, I can prove that this is true because while I was preparing these slides earlier today and I went to that repository to take that screenshot, I noticed that there was an open pull request on there. And I opened it up and I screen grabbed this because what had happened was someone who I think I have, I, actually I may have been on an instructor training call with this person um, a couple of weeks ago, but they came here um, reporting that a, a link was broken in the setup instructions and open a pull request to fix it so that the so that the link works again and i was able to say hey thanks very much merge their suggestion and now the link is fixed in the lesson for everyone who, who's using it and this kind of um community led maintenance of um of lesson materials in the same kind of way as you have community editing and curation of content in wikipedia articles for example is one of the really major advantages to this kind of open approach um because it means that your educational resources that you develop or that someone else develops are much more sustainable in the long term they're much more likely to survive for example if the person who was the principal author of that lesson um has to leave the project um, goes off and does other things the the community can kind of take ownership of that of that lesson and keep working on it keep improving it over time some of the other advantages of course taking a, an open approach and making your uh, resources easy to find and um, free to use um, accessible to as many people as possible means that you're really increasing access to the knowledge that's being shared uh, through those educational resources. It also can really increase the reach of whatever your project is um, by making sure that there are as few barriers as possible for people to be able to, to access those materials. And I guess by extension, that means that you're also increasing the impact of the, of the work that you're doing and the education that you're trying to, um, trying to share. Um, what we see in the carpentries as well, I think, is that um, because we've got a large community of people that are all looking at these lessons and using them and, and that can provide feedback and suggest changes, that increase in the number of kind of perspectives on those lessons results in better lessons themselves. So we've got a lot of examples of where um, of where there's been lesson material that includes sort of um, context specific examples um, about baseball or something that don't make sense to people who don't live in parts of the world where people frequently play baseball. And so you have um, kind of the opportunity to recognize those uh, perhaps inaccessible examples and analogies and, and fix them, for example. And that's, a, that's only one example really of how these, this increase in perspectives can, can improve the, the quality of the materials. Um, I, I briefly mentioned before that, um, as well as the source kind of for the content of these lesson websites, all of the infrastructure that we use to, to build the lesson websites from these source files is also openly available um, and openly licensed as open source software. And by providing that as well, I believe that we really empower other people um, to make more open educational resources by making it easier for, for people to to take the tools and use it for themselves and i just i like including this map wherever i can in pretty much every talk that i give um but here i think it um it's a nice example of how taking this kind of open approach to education can increase the and expand the reach of the of the education that you're trying to do but what this map shows is um the locations of all of the carpentries workshops that have taken place since I think 2015. Um, so the circles are um, 
typically kind of towns and cities, settlements of some kind, and the size of the circle roughly indicates how many workshops, uh, relatively speaking, have taken place at each of those. And then the the countries are, are shaded by um, total number of, of workshops. So you hopefully gives you some impression of the kind of um, global reach that the Carpentries has been able to achieve through this sort of community-led um, open approach to, to um, teaching these skills. So lastly, I promised you aware as well. Um, this is some places where you where I can recommend that you go to find um, open educational resources. There are, of course, many, many more places than only the ones that I'm um, showing here. But these are ones that I'm fami familiar enough with that I feel um, confident I can I can recommend in terms of following good practices and so on. Um, the, the I mentioned the Carpentries already, but um, the Carpentries Incubator and the Carpentries Lab is the, are the spaces that we provide to our community for the development and publication of their own lessons. So sort of they're not official Carpentries lessons, but they're they're developed and owned by the community. And there's 120, more than 120 lessons, I think, there that, that are being developed. And all of those are similarly uh, published under the CC BY license that I mentioned earlier. Um, the Turing Way, not really designed for teaching in workshops exactly, but more of a kind of um, longer format um, book um, that's been that's been written on on open science approaches. Um, Meta Decencia, um, doing cool open educational things in Latin America. Um, Code Refinery and Programming Historian are two other um, sources of, of open educational materials on, on slightly different topics from those that are covered by the Carpentries. And lastly, the Journal of Open Source Education is a great place to go and take a look because that's a that's a journal um, that practice. Um, kind of follows good practices in terms of open peer review and so on that's publishing um, open source um, software that can be used in educational settings and um, open source lesson materials themselves as well. So that's a really good place to go and, and take a look through the pretty large catalog of, um, of open educational resources that they've published over the years. I'm going to drop links to all of those into the um, shared notes document in a moment when I'm finished talking. And so I'll leave you with a quote from the introduction to that uh, UNESCO recommendation that I that I mentioned earlier. Um, and I'll move the chat so I can actually see it on my screen. Um, so the um, and one of the main authors, I guess, of that, of that document um, said that open educational resources represent a unique tool to foster learning and knowledge sharing, um, which are essential to build inclusive knowledge societies and to achieve um, UNESCO's, actually, I think the United Nations Sustainable Development Goals around um, increasing access to education. So, yeah, um, I encourage you really to um, whatever your the projects that you're working on through through OLS, um, I encourage you to take an open approach to um, development and publication of any of the educational resources that you're developing alongside those projects associated with those projects or in, in other parts of your life as well. Um, generally speaking, go out there, see what other people have already created that you could maybe reuse and modify for your own purposes and make sure that you similarly share the things that you create so that other people have a chance to, to use and reuse those um, in the same kind of way. Thank you very much for listening. Um, I'll be happy to answer any questions that you've got for me now, but you can also um, reach out to me by email um, uh, if you'd like to. I, I made sure that my email address is in the is in the shared notes. And thanks for the invitation as well um, to come here and talk. Thank you, Toby. That was um, really interesting. I'm, I'm going to look at the notes if we have questions. Do we usually have questions? Uh, okay. I cannot see any question now in the notes, but then if someone wants to speak or ask a question, please go ahead. I, I can start with a question. I'm, I'm just thinking out loud. 
So like um, one thing that I am thinking through um, AI and kind of one area that has been a struggle is really when you come to factual uh, content, which education in, in essence, you need to make sure that what you are presenting to everyone, it's um, actually the right, the right information. And so it's there a mechanism that you use to ensure when people uh, put up um, different educational um, resources, they have been verified that the content is actually right. Um, I don't think that there's a, I'm, I'm not aware of a um, generalizable approach to, to doing that. Like some something, the dream would be that you could uh, provide a URL and click a button and find out whether or not the stuff that's in there is accurate. But the, the, the approach, I mentioned the Journal of um, Open Education, um, Open Source Education, sorry, in, in the slides. Um, and... I mentioned as well um, these two spaces that we provide for the communities to develop to develop lessons within the carpentries as well, the carpentries incubator and the carpentries lab. And in both cases, um, we're relying on on um, open peer review for for that, I suppose. And so um, we provide the incubator as a space for community members to um, start developing new lessons and kind of iterate on them and so on. And, and, and so you've got lessons there that are in various stages of that development process. Um, but then the rationale for providing the second space to the Carpentries Lab is that when the community is ready, they can submit those lessons they've been developing in the incubator for um peer review and then once those lessons pass through that peer review process they get moved into the into the carpentry's lab and we're really relying there as i think jose the journal of open source education are we're relying on reviewers to be able to um like notice flag up if something isn't accurate um in within the lesson materials um but yeah, that's that's the approach, at least that the we're taking and the, the journals take it. Um, yeah, I think that's that's what I've got for you on that one. Oh, thank you. That that seems reasonable. I think there is uh, a question in the so does the carpentries interact with slash receive guidance from any pedagogical cabinet to create the classes? So um, if I understand the question correctly, so so we, for our official um, lessons, so the software carpentry, data carpentry, library carpentry, those lessons, they all have um, a panel of curriculum advisors who we rely on to, um, to sort of guide the long-term development of that curriculum. So it's their... Um, within that role within the community they are um, kind of letting us know if something in a lesson is no longer relevant or no longer accurate as, as things in the in the um, domain change for example and then um, providing that feedback to the contributor community with the hope that we as a group kind of collectively can adjust the lesson materials to to match back up with the expectations of those of those curriculum advisors. Um, and in terms of how the materials are, are taught in workshops, we run a um, short form instructor training program that kind of teaches good practices, good approaches to to um, teaching. Um, computational methods in general and, and that the curriculum for that instructor training and the certification that that, that comes along with it um, that's based on um, research findings in in educational psychology about um, how how we learn things and what how to create a, a positive environment to promote learning and so on um, in the hope that that equips our instructors who then go on to teach those workshops with the skills that they need to to do it effectively. Um, yeah, okay. I, if I didn't answer the question, Virginia, please um, feel free.
Virginia? Okay. Oh, sorry, I wrote in the chat, but thank okay. you, Toby. You definitely answer it. Don't worry. Thank you very much. Yeah, thank you very much, Toby. Um, so we're supposed to have a breakout session. Uh, but I'm not sure who wants to be in the breakout. I can see uh one, two in the writing, one. Um, so Robert, do you want to be in a writing or speaking breakout room? Uh, okay, both fine. So uh probably what I would suggest is if if it's okay with everyone. Just take a few minutes to discuss these few questions. The speakers are also invited to really uh, contribute in the discussion. And what we have is two main questions of what are the benefits of becoming an open, sci open scientist? The two main questions are in the uh, notes, but I'm going to share them in the message here. What are the benefits of becoming an open scientist? What incentives? What incentive? What incentives to participate in open science? Just science. Have you encountered? Have you encountered? So, what are the incentives that you've encountered by participating in open science in your life? Um, th this is a question I guess for everyone. If anybody wants to think about it or say something, whether in written or whether written or uh, say it out, please. So we have from, I, I hope I'm pronouncing the name right, Marlo. I think what Toby just mentioned is a very important benefit of open science. More people read or use your work, it increases impact. Uh, um, yes, and uh, we have breakout rooms. If you want to talk about this issue, you can do that for a few minutes. Uh, so I would like to get, oh, thank you. I would like to get a, a hand up or down that we can, yes, uh, let me get, get Robert. Robert, please go ahead. Yeah, so we can have a breakout room. So if I thought maybe we are doing the breakout room now here, then I would have answered the question for me. Whatever you feel like. No, please go ahead. I think we, we are not that much, so we can have yeah. the breakout room here if that's okay with everyone. Hmm. For me, the, the benefit is like, honestly, also to... Like I, I become more human again because I I can say, look, this is what I did and I don't claim I knew it all and there were no errors, but to my best knowledge, this is what I did. And if you disagree, like this was good, like you say this was not good enough, then you have the chance and you can talk to me. And if I consider close science then you see a paper there is something in there but you can't go into details and that's for me the benefit um, hmm. thank you robert i i to add to that i think for me it's also create some form of accountability because when you do a close science kind of uh there isn't a lot of opportunity for fact checking of what the content of what you've written there, but when it's open, the authors need to be very much deliberate to ensure that the content is really accurate because that could affect their reputation. So it increases the quality of the output, the resources that we have out there. Can I, can I add something? Um. Yes, please. Hi, you are Scott Edmonds. I'm sorry I came uh, late, but um, I definitely, yeah, fairness, I think, is a, is a good 
um, is how I see things, but like both in terms of the fair principles, findable, accessible, interoperable, reusable, right? It's better science, but it's also more equitable. It's fair as in it's more equitable as well. It's not just some wealthy proprietary people kind of keeping hold of things, but it in theory. And, you know, if you see, read the open science recommendations from UNESCO, a large part of it is the, you know, equitable you know being more equitable and thinking about those sides not just the nitty-gritty on the technical side as well so yeah oh, thank you thank you scott um i toby please go ahead um one of the biggest advantages that i've enjoyed from getting involved in um open science has been um I guess benefiting from the becoming part of a community around it. Um, I have to confess that my, um, or concede at least that my research career in formal terms was pretty brief, pretty much a PhD. And then that was it because I didn't have a very good time doing the PhD, but I've, I've worked for years kind of adjacent to research um, and, and getting more and more involved in the open science movement. And I, I found it to be a collective of people who are extremely um, kind of inspiring and supportive. Um, and I think that that's, it's easy to focus on all of the um, like tangible and philosophical perhaps um arguments for for doing your science out in the open all of which i agree with but um on like a personal level the thing that i think has been best for me about getting involved in all of it is just all of the connections that i've made like the network that i've built with all of these cool people doing really interesting things um all over the world it's, it's just a nice thing to be involved in um thank you that was nice um virginia mentioned in the chat also true, Robert, I believe this is the way of doing things better by doing it as a community. And I think that also resonates with what Toby mentioned about um, building a community and engaging with the community. Um, I think we can um, have the presentation from Scott now, and then if we have a few minutes at the end, we can talk more. So please, Scott, if you're ready. Okay, thank you. I'm sorry I, I turned up late. I'm in, uh, I just arrived in Thailand um, last night and uh, I'm here for a workshop which I can uh, men briefly mention the relevance of at, at the end. But um, uh, yeah, I was tasked to talk about um, open access publishing, which is quite a broad topic and and um it can go a lot of different ways in, in 10 minutes there's not a huge amount that um uh you, you know you can't, can't can't cover everything um I've, I've come up with a bit of a you know ba basic brief 101 and then um at the end talked about um some of the stuff that that, that i've been doing um in this area and but hopefully it will can provoke some discussion and there's definitely a few areas like article processing charges licensing things like that that um will hopefully be um we can we can discuss more um so um the rationale for open science is ag against this closeness right so many there's so many barriers and this one tackles the access to scientific knowledge um barrier and um, the open access movement has been going a couple of decades now, and it really came out of solving this problem um, until quite recently. All of the scientific knowledge was locked up, very expensive subscriptions, um, and only, you know, wealthy universities could access this. And pe people who need this, taxpayers, the public, even, you know, doctors, patients um, cannot get access to this to this knowledge and this drove um many people to try and um change things if you uh, so these stats are uh, uh from 2015 
But um, actually, I, I, I checked recently and the profit margins are still the same for Elsevier. It, it, it's it's quite an embarrassing, publishing is a very uh, embarrassing industry in that it, it's more extractive than uh, gold mining, to tobacco, automobiles. Um, it, it, it's the most profitable industry in the world. And they're taking this from the from the taxpayer and, and having profit margins of up to 40% for the for these big publishers. It, it's 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 kind of crazy. Um, and um, researchers uh, can see the kind of unfairness of this and took things into their own hands. Um, movements such as cost of knowledge, the um, um, researchers basically set up a website to boycott uh, Elsevier, saying that they will never publish and um, and uh, peer review for them, and, and more than twenty thousand people sign this, and 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 it kind of grew in a number of ways, and the open access movement was 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 one of the main ones that came to like tackle this problem. Um, so. Uh, open access, there's a lot of different definitions. People, um, especially publishers selling things, kind of define this in various ways. But the, there were a, a, a number of meetings that really, um, the, the Berlin and, and Budapest open access meetings really um, defined, um, and th this was a, a, you know, a decade or two ago, defined what true open access should be. Um, it defines open access as the 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 the, the, the literature, needs to be freely available but not not just you know you don't just stick it up it needs open licensing it needs to be open for crawling um for indexing and also uh, data mining um and there must not be any financial legal or technical barriers to do that and and so this this definition means that you have that authors own their own work um you know that you that needs to be acknowledged and properly cited um and but and so the CCBY, the Creative Commons BY license, is the true open access license. Some publishers try to stick in like NC clauses and things like that. And that's purely because they want to sell. They still want control of this for data mining and and and, and making money this way, um, double dipping so they can sell pre reprints and things like that. But so this is not to be true open access. Um, it needs to be under a CCBY license um and um yeah if there's any licensing nerds here we can we can just discuss this at, at the end um so uh, the first open access journals kind of late 90s early 2000s launched the movement slowly grew but it really got turbocharged with um the funders getting on board um coalition s stating that open access uh, you know they wanted by the 2020s to be um to become basically mandated and that most of these funders are uh, you know in europe but also you know gates foundation some international ones have come on board this and and, and mandated this and it really forced the hands of the big publishers that uh, there was enough funders insisting on this so publishers pretty much all have to offer open access options at least um and i'll, I'll come to this later um, and so uh, the DOAJ, this is a great resource, the um, uh, Director of Open Access Journals, um, and they produce a white list of journals that they that they think uh, meet certain criteria and are, are good enough and and uh, to be you know uh, true open access journals meeting the licensing but also meeting kind of quality thresholds. And so currently, there's about twenty thousand journals on this list. 80 languages, 136 countries. So if you want to know, um, there were there have been like journal blacklists, but this is a more positive journal whitelist. If you want to find a decent open access journal in your field or in your country, DOAJ is the resource for this. Um, and the 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 kind of the 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 you know for pure selfish reasons as a researcher, what 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 the benefits of open access? It means that people can read your research. It's increased visibility, increased citations. There's good good data for this. It means that not just wealthy academics can read this. It drives innovation from other sources, um, more global impact as well. It's not just, you know, the, the, the wealthy countries um, have access to these things. General public, you know, um, um, and, you know, let, letting other kind of other alternative uh, people see this increased trust 
um, uh, in research and then also, um, the, you know, these new funder mandates, for, for example. Um, and so this this is probably a talking point for discussion that the different types of open access that have kind of evolved. But, you know, it ha the end product has to be, you know, a CCBY open thing. But the way, but the way that you pay for this and uh, different models, particularly because the traditional publishers did not want to give away their their kind of healthy, um, you know, uh, the way they monetize their back catalog and stuff. So uh, gold open access is the you, and somebody has to pay for publishing rather than um readers in in the you know and libraries uh, uh pay for it in the closed access form the 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 authors and the authors funders have to pay have to pay right it, it's 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 still publishing but it it just changes the the funding model really so gold is fully open access and you know um and uh, you you pay the open uh, the APC and then it, it's immediately accessible. Um, there's this kind of hybrid options where journals some of them still have subscriptions, but if you pay if you um so a, a hybrid journal um you would pay a fee and then the the um. Uh, this makes it open access, but there are closed access articles in there, and the green route is um uh where um the journal allows you to publish the non the non typeset and peer reviewed version on a on an institutional repository and then if you can do a good job in making the 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 metadata you know searchable and discoverable then people can find both versions the the publisher's version and the and the open version that that that's the the theory behind this there's also um uh, um, uh, platinum, um, uh, oh no, di no, diamond open access, where um, it, the author does basically. There's no, uh, it, it's completely open access, but uh, nobody pays. Uh, I mean, the, the the through other forms of funding and and revenue, the the authors don't have to pay either. Um, you know, obviously this would be the goal, but it's 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 um it's interesting how how these diamond journals can get funded and 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 what they can achieve and so th this is a huge talking point now that you know there was there was this big barrier before to readers and um open access it definitely made things and and the the first open access publishers that you know that not for profit or had very small profit margins it's taken some time but there's now some open access publishers that are making big amounts of money and now it's shifting these barriers to the to the authors and so how we um there's important discussions to be made on like what is a how how much should we should be paying with this how and 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 the like so we can discuss this um uh, later um okay um and uh you know the unesco open science recommendation um uh, really tackled a lot of these issues you know fulfilling the human right of access to science and so, um, you know, and mo most of the member states of the world have now signed this, pledging this. And in uh, what the, in the four pillars of open science, open source, open scientific knowledge, scientific publications and access to to them in this manner fits in there. Right. It's a, a key part of of open science, scientific knowledge that that is the, you know, the, the, the kind of priority for the 21st century and and, and research going forwards. Um, and and preprints as well. This has been the big, at least in the life sciences in the in the last decade. It's the tenth birthday of 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 archive this month of bioarchive this month, um, and and this has also really changed the way that that um, research has been you know ex become accessible and discoverable because um, you know a greater and greater proportion of research is available in in preprint form really, and so the publishers are now taking. The second part, which is the the, the peer reviewed um, form, and so it's the, the relationship between these. E Life has had a very interesting model, um, trying to sort of uh, decouple parts of parts of this that we can that we can talk about. Um, so I'll end then quickly, just for giving some examples of uh, my my work in this area, and specifically open data. Um, because our journal, uh, Giga Science, we launched, um, so I'm the editor-in-chief, I, I forgot to introduce myself, but I'm the editor-in-chief of Giga Science. We've been going for 11 years now, um, 
publishing data papers, um, software, but also data. These data notes incentivize people sharing their data. Um, and we also uh, run a, a data repository where we can help people for kind of intermediate data and data that doesn't necessarily have a home, make it uh, publicly available and, and have a team that, so we're trying to add services just beyond publishing papers, but to, to actually data. Um, so that's our model and other, other publishers have, have, have joined this uh, area in the last decade. So we launched a second journal uh, in, in 2020 um, uh, to do to do some different things um, using an XML first workflow to address some of these open science recommendations, making things cheaper, faster, more interactive, and and having some other cool um, features that make more date that make publishing more um, accessible. Um, just a, a, a quick quick example here is um, because our costs and things were low, we got some sponsorship from the World Health Organization to break these, remove these final barriers. Um, uh, so they would fund our low article processing charges and also fund some uh, a, a data manager to, to help um, researchers specific in the area of uh, uh, vector borne diseases to share their data. And incentive, the, the data publication was kind of incentive for them to do this work. So um, being in having this uh, XML format means we can do parallel proofing of languages. So um, uh, more than half of these submissions were from uh, Latin America. Um, they were in uh, in English, but also in Sp they wrote them in Spanish and Portuguese first. So we gave the uh, authors the um, we proof the languages in 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 parallel, and so you can click a button, and it switches into Portuguese, for example. So, uh, readers in 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 Brazil and 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 uh, can 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 better understand this. Um, and also the data is in situ in the paper, so it's much easier for people to basically browse, inspect the data, understand it, and then you can click a button, and the the data pops out of the papers. Um, having the uh, having the uh, text in the XML, uh, having the multiple languages in the XML means that actually in PubMed Central and and in Mirrors they can actually have the English and the multilingual version. Um, it's linked to preprints in 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 this example Cielo preprints. Um, this this targeted data publishing uh, uh, project that we did, and this is why I'm in in um, Thailand now because I'm going to a vector borne diseases uh, meeting to 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 meet some of the some of these people. But it, it released data from more than fifty countries, uh, half a million re re occurrence records, really important for public health. Many different data types, and the the thing that we're most proud of is it was very you know the first call had more than half the papers were from latin america we're finishing off a second call now we've got papers from D uh, uh, drc um burkina faso um some asian ones as well like so it really uh removing the cost uh, having this additional support and multilingual support as well has meant that it's really kind of opened up the the places that we we, we we've got this data from um and yeah the, the the phase two um we're just putting to bed and has some uh, really great um uh, re you know really broad uh, taxonomic and and geographical representation so okay hopefully we've got a bit of time left that uh, we could discuss uh, the these talking points that i've raised so um feel free to yeah put questions in the chat um is there anything in the uh is there anything in the um, um yes yeah thank yes thank you thank you scott i'm looking at the uh other part we have a question the first one is uh maybe this will come up later but how do you feel about authors paying exorbitant prices to have their papers published open access in a journal from a tradition for a traditional journal so it's it's as I said, I'm I'm embarrassed at these costs, right? The re the reason we developed this new journal was to try and reduce the costs 
Um, but when nature will charge like eleven thousand euros or something for a, for an APC, it's it's and and they're making, and 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 actually na- nature that they um they're undergoing an I they 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 keep having failed IPOs. They're owned by venture capital companies. Um, the Singaporean government and and the uh, that want enormous profit margins to they, they want even higher profit margins and they can't float it on the stock market until it, it's even higher so they're that's why they are and they're doing this and it's and so they're off you know for profit public not for profit publishers you know obviously reduce the costs um we definitely need to think about uh new platforms new models um but uh, but ultimately it does it it if people want peer review and and um so some of the things that the publishers provide then then it has a, then it has a cost so we need to have to really discuss what 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 it's worth and 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 who funds this because yeah um currently th- those sorts of eye watering article processing charges are like a massive barrier and uh, are now really unfair so um yes. I, I like plus for example they are really trying to come up with new new funding models and e- experimenting and it's a lot more working directly with funders and 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 the like but even then like if they're charging 11,000 euros that's taking taxpayer money from the from the funders as well so yeah yes yeah. so i have um, a comment from Toby in the chat we have the same dilemma with the peer review of lessons I mentioned earlier. Uh, that is how do we incentivize slash reward reviewers? Yeah, this is a very good, this is another good question. And it's getting harder the, as publishing kind of keeps keeps growing. Um, it gets harder and harder to find peer reviewers um, in, in all of these er- in all of these areas. But then, if you pay them, then already you know, it's already expensive. That cost then immediately just transfers onto, um, back onto the onto the author or the people paying subscription. It's very um, so. There's there's work on so. What one thing that we do, for example, is open peer review because we feel it's there's that transparency part um, that you know you trust research more if you can actually um see what's happened under the hood right and how how it's been assessed and stuff you see all of these terrible papers that come out like was that really peer reviewed what the hell happened um but it also we part of the reason we do this is also to give credit for the reviewers like currently that it's not a, an amazingly recognized form of credit but there are platforms and tools that you can link peer reviewing onto your orchid profiles for example um pub publons which is now owned by clarivate um and other platforms were really kind of um capturing that information and and so it, you kind of you know these things on your sort of digital cv shows that you're a that you're a that you're a peer reviewer and it's not credited that much but still you know you know universities academics even uh, i keep getting emails from um uh, like early career researchers in the US for their green card applications, they have to show that they peer review that they that they are um, it gives them a level of seniority and it actually helps in their like green card applications in the US. So I have to keep writing letters, but I think look, we do open peer review. You can show them the peer, you don't even need to come to me to get a letter approving this because because we're already like making all of this public, for example. Um, and uh, there's oh, this movement as well with preprint peer reviewing, where you can really kind of take matters into your own hands and um, and just if there's a preprint that you're interested, peer review it. And there's that you know e life, um, and so our Gigabyte Journal, for example, we mandate peer re- preprints for all of our papers, and we link the peer reviews on those various um, infrastructure that will show the peer reviews on the preprints, for example. There's more, there's technical approaches that can do this and people have to then, it needs to become culture, culturally accepted and credited for for for, do, for doing all of this stuff, right? Yeah, it needs to include employees, you know, yes, exactly. The universities and other academic institutions and funders need to um, give the, give it the, if, if we feel it has value, then we need to um, 
uh credit the people who who make it happen right the peer reviewers so oh yeah no uh, yeah oh and the the, the the message that green cards should not depend on people engaging in peer review right yeah yeah but it but it's good like if it it's an, it's another form of credit and and it's if, if it's something that you've done you should get you know it's good that you can show that you're doing these things yeah, yeah. um thank you uh, we have a few more questions one in the notes i got the impression perhaps backed by the data you showed about preprint publication that preprints became much more prevalent during the early stages of covid-19 pandemic do you think this change is permanent or will we see researchers revert to the old way of publishing straight to a journal now that development has have slowed down with covid this is a very good question and actually we talked to when you talk to bioarchive and asap bio and stuff there were huge there's been like generally it's been a, a you know preprints have been an upward mo movement but uh, covid really turbocharged this and there was just this huge explosion in in bioarchive and medarchive med archive, because it's so much of it was medical research medarchive got a huge huge explosion in that first year you know first one or two years but then they've seen a, a a crash in submissions and journals as well have seen um there was a huge wave everybody was stuck at home writing papers getting rid of old papers that they had so the, the everything everything in this sort of research you know publishing pre-printing protocol producing ecosystem there was this big covid boom and then a bit of a bust at least the year after and people are exhausted people it's hard to tell whether it, the culture's changed or it's just 2022 everybody's just dead and everybody like needs a break and everyone's productivity has come down so it may be i think it's stabilized and journal submissions have gone up i i i keep talk whenever whenever there's a whenever you meet the sort of the bio archive people and this is a common conversation i i i it hasn't quite hit the highs that it was in covid i think um i think it's stable and then but every everything crashed every there's just been a like a big science productivity crash for a year and i think this 2023 is getting a bit better than 2022 but we'll see in that we'll see if the i haven't seen the latest data on preprints but i it, it may hopefully start growing again yeah um thank you and the last question we have is are there guidelines to contribute to data sets on observable on-site marine variables i don't find something similar in the website mm. um for, are you talking is the question on giga on our papers is this on yes hi i i made the question I was checking out the kind of data sets that you have in your, yes, in the GIA website. And I yeah. realized there are satellite imageries or satellite information, but not of on-site information. I don't know if you're if there is something you're interested in, if this is already exists and I couldn't find it or is not, uh, um, or it's quite complicated to achieve, which is actually something we've been discussing about in the marine environment a lot. <laughs> I, I, I'm, I'm trying to get my head around so so we've published a few examples with like satellite imagery not a huge amount but but what's the alternative that you can, can oh can oh sorry more? yes of going on site to see to take samples and after processing you get information for example about the abundance of certain species okay um, yeah and maybe doing something to to make it similar uh, across different places in, in the world and share yeah. the data to be used openly of course but it, it was it's always hard to find one way to put data that it could be used by everyone and maybe i don't know if you ever want, made something deep similar to this so we we have a very broad scope and we take data from like all you know so many different fields biological and biomedical but it, it, you know it goes even to like touches on earth science and you know data can be so multi-dimensional and 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 have so many different sources so we always we, we you know we encourage 
people to submit in field specific repositories if they're there and you know they hopefully um have you know follow those standards and this we work this into the peer review to make sure they're doing this and um and also our own curators so baseline those sorts of baseline data sets are like so useful we, we you know this is the kind of stuff that we that we we get a few of these but this is the data that like we would love to get day by day um so the, the the these uh vector for for example these vector studies all of that data goes in the GBIF repository. It's a big you know global biodiversity database. They really standardize the you know it has to pass a validation tool to get in there, and it's, it's got all of the G you know the geo it's it's observation data, so it's all ge geo located around the world in a very very standardized. Um, Darwin core format, for example, but you know we have metagenomics um, papers, start, start sampling, you know, environmental, um, uh, you know, environmental data around the world, and we push them to follow um, various checklists and guidelines for presenting, you know, that that type of data, um, including you know, giving guidelines on. Um, uh, how how you know uh, ge geographical information should be presented and things like that so it, you know we we don't write these guidelines right there's people who have published checklists and and there's still there's always new types of data that don't have standards and stuff but we in the in the peer review process this is the kind of value that we, that we add we push people to to at least try and follow what best practice there is um and and you know show them the guidelines and things that they need to follow and that's in our instructions for authors and also in the data curation step that we do our curators will basically talk to them and say like have you you know can we have these the, there's this particular checklist for this kind of data can you can you follow this or for example so i don't know if that helps definitely i wish check out that geo that you mentioned so thank you very mm -hmm. much Yes, thank you very much, everyone. I think we have passed the time of the call by about six minutes, but thank you for speaking. I think this brings us to the end of the call. I would once once again to thank Toby and um, Scott for the presentations and everyone that's here, Virginia, Urban, Marlo, and uh, Pradeep. Thank you, everyone, for uh, joining today's call. I will stop the recording, and then if anybody wants to talk further, you are free to do so. Thank you.